Hello everyone, welcome to Philosophy Roulette. I'm your host, Norger Zero, where we attempt to speedrun philosophy on Twitch.tv and later on YouTube's if I ever get around to uploading them. So, let's see what's on the docket for today. I don't know if anything has, uh, of any philosophical interest has happened to me the last few days, at least not since, uh, I don't know, when, when was that troll I ran into? Uh, that was last time. Don't know if, I think they stopped posting. They realized they weren't going to get me to be racist. In like, a few comments on YouTube. But, I just called them out at the end and I was like, you know what? No, you're wrong. They were expecting me to be like, reconciliatory. I was like, no, you're just wrong. Like, sorry. Goodbye. So. It's an interesting thing though, you know. The, uh. Trying to argue like people are inherently stupid with crappy arguments. It just, it's like, at least if you had good arguments, it'd be one thing. But they don't have good arguments. It's just so bad. All right, so let's go see what's on the uh, hot list for last few days. Install Google Translate extension. Why is this like not in English? Uh, cancel. People be sending me messages, or is this me going live? Hey, I went live. How do you like that? Cool. Thank you, uh, Discord. Journal of Value Inquiry. Patristica et Medievalia. That's probably why. Was this Italian or something? I don't even know. My apologies. My apologies to everyone. Una diversa anche notable faction interpretativa del texto. Is this like Spanish? And I didn't even realize. Man, I'm an idiot. World Literature and Linguistics. Yeah. Acta Analytica. So says, uh, well, we can look at Acta Analytica. It's a good journal. Well, it's analy <laughs> analytic philosophy, of course. AI and society always pumping out the papers. Good for you. We just did a few of their papers, so we can like go move on to something else. Eastern European Journal of Enterprise Technologies. Never seen that before. Identification of regularities in the development of baby economy as a component of the nano level of economy system. Okay. Erkentness, that's a good journal. We could check out what they have. See if there's anything here. Presentism, continuous time travel, and the phenomenology of passage. Hmm. Want to do a philosophy of time? Like, if anyone's out there and wants to, uh, make a suggestion i do take suggestions uh, we argue that a certain variety of presentist time travel ends up significantly undermining the motivational foundations which lead some but not all presentists to their view we suggest that if presentism is motivated by phenomenology and part of that phenomenology is an experimental datum that we experience temporal passage then the basis for believing presentism is less secure than we might have thought but it's not available to download, so what are you going to do? Alright, not going to do that one. Uh, let's see. Okay, not that many short papers. The support interval. A frequentist confidence interval can be constructed by inter inverting a hypothesis test such that the interval contains only a parameter value that would not have been rejected by the test. Uh, okay, so we could do... A this is sort of interesting, but a little bit excessive. Hoping for metanormative realism. Interesting. Debates in meta-ethics about metanormative realism, quasi-realism, anti-realism, and nihilism mostly focus on epistemic reasons for belief about values. Okay. Let's see what the next one is. Programming infinite machines. That could be cool. I mean, the problem is, uh, of course, if it gets technical, then it's hard to uh, read the paper. But it's only eight pages, so I'm going to click on it. Powerful problems for powerful qualities. Ooh. Um, let's click on that. That might be interesting. Might be a little metaphysics. Hmm, not available though. Bah. Sometimes scholar knows better. Archive.org. Here we go. Let's go take a look real fast. See how bad it uh 
technically is. See, this is like, look how much, how fun this is with all the pictures, but it's very hard to uh, describe what's going on. But it's short enough that I'm willing to take a chance. That's kind of funny. Because, uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is Programming Infinite Machines, right? This is the right paper? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is a nice short paper in our Kentness, a uh, Journal of Analytic Philosophy, specializing in sort of the technical end of things. And, uh, yeah, let's just do this for uh, a little bit of fun. Okay, there we go. Uh, do I need to do other stuff? I do need to do other stuff. This one here. And there we go. Uh, looks like we are working. Cool. So. Should be a hopefully a nice short paper, um, and we'll see if it works. If it not, not if it is cool, and uh, and we're off. So this is in it says inverted Thompson's lamp paradox is kind of what's going on here. So it looks like they might have been talking about this about programming infinite machines by Anton A. Kutsenko, Jacobs University. I apologize for how I say everyone's names. <sighs> The classical Thompson's lamp paradox appears in one. What's one? Thompson task analysis in 1954. Interesting. That was cool that that let me jump back and forth. Let us provide its computer interpretation. Suppose that we have one byte A of memory and some CPU which can carry out an infinite number of operations within a finite length of time. What does that even mean that you can do an infinite number of operations within a fi finite number length of time? Does that mean there's an infinite number of different things it could do in the finite length of time, but it can't do infinite amounts of things in finite time, can it? I don't know, because that would be... It would look like that would be infinite time if you could do infinite things. But all right, yeah, let's assume that you could do any number of things, which uh, is not countable. Consider the following set of instructions, so-called Zeno process. Okay, so this might even be a Zeno paradox. That's kind of cool. All right, so T0, then goes, and then A's at 0. T goes to a half, A's at 1. T goes to 3 fourths. A goes to 0. So A is going back and forth, 0 to 1. And uh, T is, uh, you know, progressively getting to be from 0 approaching 1. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Where, C, where T is time. So, okay, so a T of time, it's assuming that CPU time of each next operation is twice as fast, is twice faster than the CPU of a previous operation. We can write Pascal code for the Thompson's program. A equals zero, zero repeat, A equals not A until false. Okay, yeah, so you're just going zero, one, zero, one, and that's so it's A is zero, and then not A would go one, and so it just keeps going. The paradox is that we cannot predict or determine the value of A after time T when all operations are completed. For the first example, this T equals 1. Yeah, because if you don't know how many T's are, then you don't know if A is 0 or 1. And why is that a paradox? Um, okay. The theoretical description of infinite machines... Okay, because it's infinite. And so if it's an infinite amount of things, you don't know... There's no end. There's no 0 or 1. Um, once you, uh, if you have an infinite series of things and one of them is going one or two or zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, then you can't pick one or the other because in this sort of infinite setting, you can't, even there's infinite numbers of them, you don't know, there is no last member ever. So th it's sort of indetermined. So even though it has to be one or the other in, in, in this sort of infinite setting where you have like an infinite number of moves, then you can never actually, uh, determine what which one's the last one and so okay <coughs> yeah the theoretical description of infinite machines appears in these places the possibility of producing of such machines in certain exotic relativistic space-time 
sometimes called Hogarth Malamet space times, is demonstrated. Four, the construction of infinite machines in continuous Newtonian universe is discussed in five. In five, it is mentioned that the proposed infinite machine is free from the Thomson paradox. In this paper, we show that such infinite machine is not free from the inverted Thomson's paradox. The rough idea of this paradox consists of changing the order of operations in the classical Thomson's paradox. This topic is also closely related to the physical church Turing thesis, which is the conjecture that no computing device that is physically realizable can exceed the computational barriers of a Turing machine, for example, C6 through 8. The result of the paper confirms this thesis since the infinite Davies machine, which allows for hypercomputation, demonstrates also an unpredictable behavior. This raises doubts about the fundamental possibility of constructing this machine and other hypercomputers, even without taking into account the quantum nature of the real world. So this is interesting right here. They're saying, basically, we've got some problems with um, our concept of uh, the results of an output of a computer, even without taking into account quantum nature of the real world. There's still a limit here that we're not going to be able to uh, outrun. So, like, so hypercomputers are not going to even be able to, this is a limit that even quantum can't uh, overcome. So that's an interesting thing right there. We'll see. Moreover, it indicates some fundamental difficulties in a continuous Newtonian universe itself. In particular, this observation may be helpful in analysis of Newtonian fluid dynamics, for example, in analysis analysis of Navier-Stokes equations. For example, if a fluid analog of the mechanism considered in section 4 exists in a continuous Newtonian universe, then the Navier-Stokes equations do not have a unique solution since the mechanism demonstrates an undefined behavior. It is known that fluid motions can be very complex, C9. They can create arbitrary small eddies and turbulent vortices with bizarre shapes. All this allows us to hope for the possibility of constructing the fluid analogs that will be close in some properties to the mechanism depicted in figure, in figure 4 below. Then it can be perspective for presenting a negative answer to the millennium problem. So this is interesting. They're touching on a huge number of things in the beginning of this paper, which is a little scary. It's not even a long paper. It's a really short paper. So the idea that they're going to have all this stuff packed into this one example is just very scary and potentially very impressive. But, like, I don't know what all of this stuff is. Like, I'm not an expert in any of these things. I mean, I may have heard of some of these things before, but I am definitely not an expert. So it's just like, well, I don't know what they're talking about but it sounds good. Another useful information about the physical church Turing thesis along with the hypercomputation and super test can be found in 10 through 14. It is also useful to note that the paradox called paradox of predictability or second oracle paradox, uh, yeah, in 15. The infinite analog of the paradox of predictability has some similar features with the inverted Thompson paradox. The corresponding analysis will be presented elsewhere. Let me see real fast. Uh, I can tell you what the paradox of predictability is. Um, if I can just see this real fast. Um, yeah, maybe. Paradox of predictability is kind of fun. Like for any of you educators out there. Um, it's like if you tell your class, we're going to have a test next week. But you're going to be surprised because I'm not going to tell you when it, when it is. So how are you going to be surprised? Well, let's see. You don't know when it is, so it's going to be a pop quiz. And you're, I'm not going to tell you when it is, but you know it's next week. So how can you predict when it is? Well, if you it wasn't Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, then you wouldn't be surprised if it was on Friday. So it couldn't be on Friday because if you were surprised, if you are not surprised, then you could predict when the quiz would be and if it wasn't monday tuesday wednesday or thursday then you know it's friday and you won't be surprised well if it's not friday then it could it be thursday but if you know it's not friday then it could then it equally can't be thursday because it couldn't be monday tuesday or wednesday since you know it's not friday then it would have to be on thursday and then you'd not be um then you wouldn't know when then you'd assume it would be on thursday and so you wouldn't be surprised about the it'd be it wouldn't be a pop quiz anymore because you'd know when it was coming and then you can do that for every other day of the week. And so, hence, you can't actually uh, tell someone that they're going to be surprised about when it's going to be next week. Because any day of the week, they're not going to be surprised. So, of course, you still give the pop quiz whatever day. And then they're surprised again. And they were should not have been able to predict it due to being surprised. And even so, they were still surprised. So, that's a fun 
a little paradox. I'm not sure if that's what this paradox of predictability is, but I've seen the other one go by that. Okay. The paper is organized as follows. Section 2 and 3 contain the description of the infinite machine and the program puzzle which demonstrates unpredictable behavior. Section 4 contains a description of a pure mechanical device which demonstrates the same undefined behavior as the program puzzle. We conclude in section 5. Alright, we got a bunch of logic stuff here and I apologize I didn't see this paragraph, but there's fun pictures later, so that's kind of what's going to happen. So we're going to have some fun pictures. So... Okay, we consider a simplified version of the infinite machine from 5. The machine M is equal to the summation of the infinite from n to infinity of uh, models consistent of an infinite number of finite machines, Mn. So there's the models N and uh, is an element of the natural numbers. See figure 1. That's this thing here. The machine M, uh, N, N plus 1 is a small copy of the machine M for all N. Uh, the machine N plus 1 is also twice as fast than the machine Mn for all N. For instance, we assume that CPU time tau of n is of mn is equal to one half uh, n for all n. So every time the machine makes a move, it speeds up. It the next move is ha takes half the time. So this is the Zeno thing. So every time a machine takes a move, you can it's indexed to half the time uh, the previous move takes. So you're never going to run out of time, but you have an infinite number of moves because every one takes uh, half the time. Okay. We do not assume that the memory of n n plus one is large is larger than the memory of the previous step n m sub n. All machines have the same size mem same memory size, say one byte for data and one kilobyte for a program code, and for built-in variables. Single-threaded CPU interpreter of each m sub n that's machine sub n can, step of the machine can perform integer and logical op operations and simple data manipulations. Each uh, machine m sub n can interact directly with adjacent m n plus one only. So it can only, everything can basically look. Yeah, nice picture here. You've got the memory. It takes whatever the C the machine, the computational power, and the memory then can act on that and then goes to the next step and these all the things only can have that one step in that little memory and each time it you move up a step it um takes half the time so it's getting smaller and smaller and this is a xeno style it's getting like smaller every time so uh, you have an infinite number of steps but you never actually take up a whole lot of space okay so let's describe some commands of the machine uh script m if cpu of the machine of the machine m sub n gets the so there's a there's a step of the machine gets the instruction copy program next something then it copies the code between program something and end something to the program of the memory of the next step and runs the copy there the instruction idle says the cpu should skip uh m cpu's time tau and for the con executing next instructions cpu time uh tau equals half of the previous one depends on the machine the previous state where this instruction idle is performed any uh step m sub n has built in variable value which refers to the byte data memory of that step and value next which refers to the byte data of the next value so the step the value associated with the next step at the beginning of a program all values are now initialized to zero this remark is very important the puzzle program the program puzzle considered below the instructions not and uh, colon equals mean the bitwise not and the assignment operation respectively. In particular, not one is equal to zero and not zero is equal to one. We assume that all instructions described above except idle take one CPU time uh, tau sub n for performing for performing. The CPU time tau sub n is equal to one half uh, n, there is the previous step, depends on the machine uh, step m sub n where the cpu instruction is performed the machine script m that's the total machine is free from the classical thompson paradox because the cpus cannot manipulate with fixed memory cell of an infinite number of times nevertheless script m is not free from the inverted thompson paradox and i apologize i know that was a uh, it's hard to do technical stuff in uh, audio format need to write this down or have a very good memory and I uh, usually skip uh, papers like this but this one's short so I hope to get through it quickly okay 
The puzzle. The following program emulates the inverted Thompson's paradox. The code is written in Pascal-based programming language. The comments are placed in parentheses. Okay, so the program is called Program Puzzle. This is the entry point. The Then you copy Program Next Puzzle. So you take the initial puzzle and you copy it to the next one. Then you tell it to idle on the previous one. The value is equal to not the value. So you uh, put like a not that and then you end the puzzle. Okay. The program starts on uh, step one, copies to step two, and starts there, waits for some time, takes the inverted value from M2, and stops. The same happens in M2, M3, and so on. In fact, the program works like a shader for multiprocessor systems. The corresponding time diagram is plotted in figure two. Let us denote the time when the ith instruction, whatever, so you go on for some time, starts on M, and let's denote the exit time by tn4 whatever that is so it's like so i is equal to one two three and then tn4 is the exit all right so you've got this formula thingy um i don't know what it says but due to one all values will be initialized and there are no conflicts between parallel programs working on different mn so different states since all adjacent machines can interact nevertheless we can not determine the value on m1 at the end of the program puzzle the reason is similar as in the inverted Thompson paradox. Both values of value 1 equals 0 and value 1 equals 1 are possible and impossible at the end of the program. More precisely, if we execute puzzle on the, the finite machine, the cascade stops, then let's see. Okay, so oh, okay, so it could be acting on any single byte memory and you don't know when it stops. So if even though you're... So like, look, so basically you got a machine that's like flipping a switch up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. It waits, it flips the switch up and down, up and down, and up and down. But if it happens an infinite number of times, you don't know where you're going to stop on it. Even though you knew at any given point where what you were doing, you can't tell where you end up. So this is the thing. So you go for value equals one, and then value equals one, zero goes for an odd end. But for n equals infinity, we cannot say if it's flipped it an even or odd number of times. So this is, yeah, so this is basically how many, if you're flipping a light switch at any point along the way, you know what you're doing, but you don't know where you ever are in terms of like an infinite group of flipping switches. Okay. So yeah, so whenever you do stuff, I'm not entirely sure what this diagram is. Okay. Let's consider another variant of the inverted Thompson's lamp paradox. Yeah, you're flipping a lamp on and off. That's why it's probably called a Thompson's lamp. All right. Consider the mechanism mousetrap depicted in figure three. This is a this is a mousetrap, people. Who knew? The mechanism consists of the beam on the spring. The beam is in tension, vertical position is fixed with a thread. <coughs> Excuse me. When the ball is tearing the thread, the beam latches horizontally and after it does not let through another ball. Okay. Consider an infinite number of finite mechanisms depicted in figure four. That's figure four. Where's figure four? All right. So this is. All right. So when the ball drops is basically, and you've got like a, it breaks the string or something. We'll see. We'll figure it out. Consider an infinite number of the finite mechanisms depicted in figure four. Each next finite mechanism is a small half the size replica of the previous finite mechanism. To avoid various and centrifugal effects, we can tune material properties of the spring and the beam of the next mechanism. We suppose also that there are infinite number of balls that move with the same constant velocity to the threads of the finite mechanisms. The size of each ball is twice smaller than the size of the previous ball. The distances between the balls and the corresponding threads are chosen such that the smaller ball can tear the thread before the larger ball can reach the clipped horizontal beam corresponding to the smaller ball. Thus, the larger ball cannot tear its thread since the beam is latched. Okay, so basically, what you've got is, a, instead of a computer sw flipping a switch up and down, you've got like a physical mechanism with like latches, like uh, clicking so balls can fall through. So this is a physical computer, basically. Um, you may have seen pictures like, there's actually a cool uh, product where they have like uh, balls dropping into a... Uh, a system of latches and the latches re represent um like ands and knots and so what they do is they let certain things go through and this is basically a physical representation of uh the logic gates that are in the computer 
So that's kind of what they've made here. They just built a physical representation of a computer, um, not using electricity, but using balls and like switch uh, things. Okay, so you can do this infinite uh, thing where you don't know what is uh, in any in any given spot. You don't know if the ball is dropped or not based on the previous balls having already been dropped. Okay. Note that any fixed constant value can be added to the distances between the balls and the threads is useful if we want that the smallest limit distance between the balls and the threads or the beams is not zero. Thus, there is a non-zero time interval between the start and the time when the balls reach the threads or latch beams. The behavior of the infinite mechanism 4 is indeterminate. We cannot predict. Will the largest beam be in a vertical or horizontal latch position after the balls fall down? The reason is the same in, as in the program puzzle. If the number of balls is a finite number, say n, then the largest beam is in the horizontal position for odd n and in the vertical position for even n. But we cannot say n equals infinity is an odd or even number. Note that in our example, we do not assume infinite masses, velocities, or densities, so the unpredictable infinite mechanism may well exist in a Newtonian universe. Of course, such a mechanism is not possible in our world because of the principles of quantum mechanics. This is an important uh, fact. I was actually going to bring this up, but like you can't actually do this in, a, in our universe because it's, well, it's just unphysical. Because once you get smaller and smaller, you need either more and more energy to like measure stuff or it just becomes impossible. You hit the plank length and then nothing makes sense at uh, anything that small. And so it's just, there's a question here, actually, is even the computer real? Because we can't uh, have infinitely small time in computers either. Um, like we just run out of... Uh, resolution the, the the computer clock does not actually run at infinite speed so you can't actually have something going half time every time so it's not it, you might you can do this in a newtonian universe maybe but you definitely can't do it in our universe and so there is a concession here that has to be made and you have to be careful about this because it really does make a difference that once you start giving up um, physical reality, then exactly what are we talking about? If you're trying to say that we're talking about physical reality and not just some theoretical uh, metaphysics. All right. And so this is the thing. So you don't know if uh, every time a ball drops, it, like sort of flips the switch left or right. And then like another ball drops, does the same thing. And then another. So you don't know which ball, um, if it's odd or even, because every time you do one of these, it flips the switches left or right. It's like, and each one of these flips all of them. And then this one flips the next one back and forth, whatever. You get the idea. It's flipping the switch in a physical way. Okay. Conclusion. Okay. This is it. Perhaps any machine which uses the actual infinity is not free from Thompson-style paradoxes. Even physically reasonable assumptions may not be helpful. Probably the main problem lies in our understanding of infinity. Nevertheless, a part of our mind can successfully develop infinite theories such as piano arithmetic. Hence, there is a natural question which, however, cannot be formulated rigorously. Is that part of our mind, is that part of our mind, is an infinite machine and how it works? Okay, you see, this is the this is the the problem. We can make up things that we call infinity. Is that real? Because we have thought of it, and the mathematicians think it's real. I don't know. I don't think the mathematicians know. I don't think any philosopher actually knows exactly what um, the status of math is. Of course, there's mathematical realists. They believe that math is real. There's people that are constructivists that it's a feature of our mind that it's been constructive um, like intuitionists and stuff and that's all cool but like this is a discussion and where exactly is it that um is that we can claim that something is infinite and real and what do you mean by real at that point it's like if you think arithmetic is real and well arithmetic goes on forever forever so that seems like an interesting thing but you can do this in a kind of toy physical reality as this infinite mechanism does you can do it in a com uh, theoretic computer as they were talking about up here um so you've got like a, pro a programming language where it 
is uh, turning something on or off, like a switch, a zero or one. That's why it's, uh, I think, a lamp paradox. You're turning the light on or off. Um, but, like, if you do it an infinite number of times, well, you can't, there's no, like, computer that can actually slice time so fast. So that's not real in the sense that it's a real computer, but it's real in terms of a mathematical series that you can, like, the Xeno, where you just, everything takes less and less time. So that's the question. Okay, so what what's the big upshot here? Well, is that you can't get out, you can't get away from this thing. If you have an infinity here, you're always stuck, and people want to have the infinity. So the question is, what is um the uh, what's what's the problem here? Like they want to say that let's see, infinite is not free. Okay. I just want to see like what what like who's who's complaining about this. Okay, so this is the computational limits of a Turing machine. Why is this a limit of what we can actually compute? Well, yeah, this is a theoretical limit of what we can compute because you can't do infinite uh, things in a computer. Now, does that actually mean that's a problem? I don't know because there's different levels of infinity. Like, so maybe once you get to the first infinity, that's a problem because maybe people want computers that can do things even faster. So if you want to have computers that, you know, can break cryptography, maybe this will actually come into play because maybe certain things will be breakable in a more reasonable amount of time, but other things won't be because this is a theoretical limit that you don't know how the computer will act after a certain maybe the first infinity maybe you can make a harder uh cryptography that yeah maybe it, it won't it takes more than one infinity to, to do it i don't know enough of the math to, to talk to about to talk about that but maybe this is something that it can be considered that once you hit this like infinite limit then you run out of um good answers in some sense you might be able to break certain things underneath that limit but once you hit that then you really are stuck and that's interesting so cool all right so this was short and sweet and fun and i've only been going for a half an hour so we'll do another paper and uh please if uh, you have questions or you want me to read something else let me know <laughs> since i know this is not everyone's ball of uh, wax but i mean it's interesting things like once you start talking about infinite mechanisms what happens and like, is the mind an infinite mechanism? And what what would happen? Like, how how would we talk about this? Yeah. So. All right. Let's try and look at the uh, reference list real fast. <sighs> okay. Cool. So let's hit save.